Our objective here is we want to go through a practice launch and recovery. Like to do it maybe more than once if we can, twice today. Uh, the first run is also the, the, the water work is the uh, important thing as far as uh, learning whether we can control it with our generation three rudder. So there's not going to be any high speed taxing, it'll be medium at best. I'm Mark Marino. I'm a trustee of the, the Duluth Aviation Institute. Look at there, he's got, he's got good control now. He, before he had no control, he set out there and go in circles till he added enough power for the rudder to take effect. The Larka Duluth was uh, an airplane that was purchased by Julius Barnes, a, a Duluth businessman, a hundred years ago back in 1913. He was uh, uh, head of the Duluth Boat Club where they uh, launched the plane. He was proud of it to the point where he named it the Lark of Duluth. And that's the replica that we're building today of that airplane. This having the airplane under control is critical to making the next step into a higher speed taxiing, which we'll do on our next run here. And then ultimately to get it in the air. So I got to be essential crew on this on this second uh, flight today, or, or water operation. We we want to do a lot of uh, operations on the water with no get to where we have no write-ups uh, on this thing before we try to fly it. Uh, so I'm I'm monitoring. I'm I'm his heads-up display. I'm giving him 4,000 with 300 RPM with my. Uh, fingers. We don't have a, a good airspeed on it yet. Uh, the original Lark of Duluth had no instruments at all. So, uh, uh, and we have at least engine instruments to to uh, provide us the information and make sure our, our investment in the engine stays safe. I started flying when I was in, in 1982 and uh, I knew when I started flying that eventually I would build an airplane and I started going to Oshkosh about the same time. And that's the inspiration. Without Oshkosh, I don't know if I would have ever built an airplane in my life. And this is the seventh airplane that I've been involved in the construction of, and it's the most unique. Uh, uh, other airplanes that I've been involved in, I've, I've had a, a good hand in, in modifying and designing, and, and, and the freedom that we have to, to build what we want uh, makes that a lot of fun. But this airplane, we're not really building what we want, we we're building what they wanted back then. I'll snug them up and then I'm gonna let you safety them. Uh, there are no plans of the airplane that survived. Uh, we've, we've looked for every piece of information we can find. We probably have every photograph that was ever taken a hundred years ago. And we use those photographs to scale and uh, discover all the details of how the airplane was built. And uh, we always kid around about building the airplane from pictures and rumors. But that's, that's the challenge, to try to get it right. And uh, uh, we look at these pictures hundreds of times, and every time we look at them, we're looking for something new. Gascalator right here. As soon as we got started, uh, other EA members started getting involved. And uh, we've got eight uh, EAA members uh, uh, from three different chapters in the area that have all come together at various levels and uh, put this thing together. I'm Tom Betts and I'm the number two builder on this Benoit project, Model 14, 1913. Benoit, awesome machine. Actually, it's before we learned how to fly and the, the technologies I think came out of the boat industry. Real craftsmen built these things, but not like we build airplanes today. The aircraft is, uh, is made of of Sitka spruce, all Sitka spruce. There's no plywood. Uh, we, we built it the way they described it with planks and beams and, and uh, we put it together in the same fashion that they did. And, it, and they built it like they built boats back then. There's, there's really not much difference between uh, the boats of the day and this airplane. So it truly is a flying boat. The sides on this airplane are half inch thick wood over framing. So it feels like the USS Constitution. And then it's lifted aloft by these spindly wings and spider web of cables that look like 
no bird's ever going to get through that web of cables between those the upper and lower wings. This was a common airfoil shape for the day in 1913. It has a quarter inch thick rib and quarter inch thick top and bottom cap strips. And these are the wing spars. They had the wing spar way up in the nose, the, what we call the D section now. After it was covered, we were required to do mechanical fasteners on the fabric, on the ribs. Uh, on every, every Thursday afternoon, Mike Gardonio would come in and sit across the table from me, and we'd hammer these nails in, 8,200 of them. And this fairly complicated looking connector here that creates our adjustment, it's made out of a motorcycle spoke. The documentation says it was, and we found a hundred year old motorcycle spoke company. And you have to wonder if it's the same company that, that created them for the Benoit aircraft. As a builder of a replica, our goal is to build it as close to what they did back then. And, and we do that even if we don't like what they did, to a point. Uh, there are a few things on the airplane that we have uh, updated to a uh, modern standard, uh, mostly for safety reasons. You know, we're not out to, to hurt ourselves or anybody else. But there are no pulleys in the airplane. They're all guide tubes. They create a lot of drag. So we built it that way and we strong arm it through the, the uh, controls and and uh, it works. In fact, in some cases, that, that uh, drag in the system kind of helps you fly a little smoother. <laughs> Here we're looking at where the rudder and elevator controls exit the empennage. Uh, the, these are made out of piano wire. And if, if that isn't unusual, it was the standard of the day and it's still available in your aircraft catalogs. The, another unusual thing about this rigging on this aircraft are a photo documentation shows shows these chafe pads shows that these cables ran right over the leading edge to the rudder and elevator uh, very unconventional again are we going to do that differently than they did it and for an authentic replica we had to do it that way and that's how it is we were always uh, reading about the the drag in this aircraft and radiator looks like one of them here and we have a honeycomb in here that's like a screen door you can look right through it so that that reduces the drag and the weight of it was 40 pounds we were quite concerned about that but we were headed toward an FCG problem so it was easy to put it up front like one of our pictures or a couple of our pictures show because they also mounted it in the rear maybe they experienced the same thing we know that back then they were constantly changing the airplane every single picture there's something different one picture of the radiators in the front uh, of the uh, center section. Another picture, it's in the back. The exhaust pipes keep changing positions. There's, there's almost nothing consistent from picture to picture on the airplane. So we know they were tweaking it and now we're finding that we have to tweak it just like they did. The aileron rigging was the last rigging we did and we finished the rigging. We noticed that in the extreme position of the ailerons, this cable was, this runaround cable was slack. And I remembered seeing that in a picture. So I brought the picture out and showed it to everyone and, and we decided, well, it's, that's the way it has to be then. It's just like they had it. The engine in this aircraft is located right behind the pilot and passenger. That's exactly the same here. The original engine is no longer available. It was a Roberts inline six cylinder, two stroke aluminum water cooled engine. And its high, its top RPM was 1200 RPM. And at that RPM, the first version put out 75 horsepower and 500 foot-pounds of torque at 1200 RPM. And the later version, 100 horsepower and 600 foot-pounds of torque at 1200 RPM. We have had to go to a marine engine because they will also run it at full power all day long, unlike an automobile engine in design. The differences in our application, we had to we had to invent our own intake system and our own exhaust system to match what some of the pictures show for our exhaust. The, uh, we do have an aviation carburetor on it. And so we're, we're tweaking that as we go too. They're not a normal match, but it's working pretty well. We have a 10 gallon fuel tank as they did. And uh, so, so we joke about uh, filling it up 
taking off and being low on gas. So even though we're using a different engine, the fact that we go through a gear reduction, we get the same power to the prop, the same RPMs, and even mathematically about the same power pulses and sound that the Roberts engine had. The propeller on the airplane was made by Sensenik. Uh, and what we did is we found a propeller in the museum at, at uh, Sun and Fun. It's an original Benoit propeller. They loaned us the propeller, we brought it to Plant City, they mapped it out digitally, copied it, and so we have a, a, an exact copy of a Benoit propeller. The cockpit's a two-seat, pilot sits here, passenger sits here. The flight controls are a little different. This, this is quite conventional with ailerons and elevators, and, but no pulleys, so these are stiff controls. And over here, we have a rudder control, and, over, and on the floor we have one pedal for the, for the accelerator. Strange, huh? And which way would this go for left and right? Well, we, we would ask people coming through the door after we decided which way it should be, and everybody was confused at first, but they came up with the same answer, and that would be a right bank, you would be going, you, you would turn that way, and it's very natural to push forward and pull your aileron over, probably, hopefully not to this extreme, because there's 32 feet of aileron in this aircraft. And then a right turn would be turning right, you'd pull, you, you, it kind of goes with your shoulders. Put that into your mind, uh, uh, using your foot for a throttle and your hand to steer. Uh, you know, you got it's not natural yet, but I think it's coming. And when I don't have to think about it anymore, we'll phase into the, the flight testing. In our build of the aircraft, of course, we came up with some concerns about the safety of the plane. Uh, we had some load testing done on, on the cables to see if they were strong enough. And actually, this was a single cable design and we were told that it was a 1.3G aircraft, aircraft with just a single cable. And this is supposed to bring us up near, two, uh, near 3Gs. So, so authenticity went out the window in favor of safety in this case. Even though they didn't have a lot of information about aviation like we have today, the databases we have, the airfoils, they didn't have any of that. It's, it's phenomenal how well they did with what they had to work with. We have all the tools. We've got the computers. We've got equipment and testing equipment. We got everything. And, and we still struggle to duplicate what they were so successful at 100 years ago. Back in 1913, the way they started this airplane was with a, a lever. They had a, they had a pin in the shaft here, and it, 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 would, uh, and it had a little camshaft on the lever. So you'd start it like a Model A. They'd pull down on it and, and it would turn the thing and start it. But what would happen is it would load up one side of the chain as you turned it and then when the engine would kick it would tighten the other side of the chain and snap it often. They broke a lot of chains. Uh, and so did the 70th anniversary version. We've gone to an electric starter. Mark's wife says you're not using that method to start this. So, but the, the other thing about the electric starter is it loads the same side of the chain that the engine does. So we haven't broken a chain yet. This is such a significant airplane uh, in that the, there's only two of them in the world right now. The one in the St. Petersburg Museum and our aircraft. There are others, uh, one other one being constructed right now in Florida. So, so this is a really rare airplane and, and I think it's we feel privileged to be able to bring it and show it to EAA members. This is why people go to EAA. They want to see the kind of things that, the rare kind of things that we're doing. So we're going to have uh, the airplane down at Oshkosh. Uh, we've been given the opportunity to have it right smack in front of the red barn for the entire show. We'll be there to talk to all the folks and uh, show them what we think the airplane is all about. I think that when people see the, the Larka Duluth at Oshkosh, it'll be the, the same kind of continued um, thing that happened to me. When I went there and discovered that I could build an airplane, somebody's going to look at this thing and say, you know what, we can do something like this too. We, we have the freedom, we have the help, we have everything that uh, uh, is necessary to make something like this happen. Back in 1913, 
uh, the city rallied around this very first airplane in the, in the bay and designed a festival to celebrate its presence. It was six weekends in a row. Thousands of people showed up. Every, everything that you can imagine in a festival was there. And the airplane was the, the centerpiece. The airplane actually flew races with, with, uh, with speedboats. So when they had this event, it was a huge success. People wanted to do something with their time. And what we're doing here now is we're just trying to duplicate a piece of that uh, fun that they had back then, try to, try to get into their shoes and their mindset of the day. So we're going to dress up in 100-year-old uh, costumes and uh, try to bring back the era. Um, people are going to see something they've never seen before, not just with the airplane, but we're going to, you know, we're, the airplane's going to be brought down to the water by a horse. <laughs> because that's probably how they moved things around back then. There weren't that many cars. Clear from. It's good to look at uh, where we came from and then look at, at where we are today. And then try to imagine where we're going to be in, in another hundred years. And hopefully this airplane will be around for a long, long time to keep that story uh, of the Lark alive. Sweet, sweet.